everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it is my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Please subscribe and bless yourself and others with access to the gospel of the kingdom of the Most High God. Bless yourself with new covenant truths and truths that are going to teach you how to stand in that covenant to resist the devil and to destroy his works. Hit like and share and put these truths in the hands of other believers who are starving to death at church. And unfortunately, that is too true too many times. Decree with me. By grace we are saved and we receive abundance of grace to save this generation. The prince of this world is judged and now he shall be cast out. Mm. You'll find scripture reference for those truths in Romans 5 and verse 17, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, Gospel of John chapter 12, verse 31. Now, I know that you discern from the title that today's subject matter is sensitive and somewhat unpleasant and downright scary at times, but... You need to understand that there are mind-binding demons that are behind incest and they build strongholds around incest that can negatively impact whole regions. And up front, I remind you again, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in heavenly places. I'm going to show you how to target the stronghold and to break its influence over your area. So regardless of whether or not you are a victim of incest, if you are a born-again child of God, you need to deal with this in your area in the spirit realm. Again, we are not targeting people. We will be praying for and releasing healing for the people that have been involved on either side of incest. What we are rooting out and aiming to destroy the influence of are the demons that promote incest. So, in order to target these things in the spirit realm, we always start our warfare based on what Jesus did at the cross. So I will advise you, put me on pause, Get your communion elements, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are going to eat or lock him, as that Hebrew word is from Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 5, which means to not only eat and to consume, but it also means to battle, to make war, to prevail and overcome. We're going to release the victory of Jesus' death and resurrection against these spiritual strongholds and these wicked spirits. So, uh, some time ago, Holy Spirit revealed to me that the strong man over this territory, this region over which I pray, was a religious spirit. So I began to use the blood of Jesus to bind him at random times, you know, just whenever I would think about it and, or it would cross my mind. But more recently, uh, within the last couple of weeks, I began using communion, receiving communion, and doing communion warfare to release the power of Jesus' victory at the cross against all religious spirits in this area. And I was doing this daily, sometimes several times a day and through the night, specifically targeting religious spirits. I even got a couple of folks to receive communion in agreement with me. Now, I was not thinking about anything about incest. I was not targeting incest. I was just targeting religious spirits because I know that they try to hinder revival. Um, they, you know, promote hypocrisy and hard-heartedness and all this kind of stuff. And I was just, just targeting those as I was being led with the Spirit. Then I had a dream. January the 19th, 2023, <laughs> I dreamed I was being prepped for an incestuous marriage 
and people were so excited for me. They were just bringing gifts. And what struck me most in the dream was that I seemed to just be numbed to the inevitability of it all. I had gotten rid of my bed trying to avoid the situation, but a Christian friend got me an identical bed to replace it, thinking that she was doing me a favor and blessing me. Yeah. Anyway, I woke up and when I went to the bathroom and I'm sitting there and I said, Lord, would you please tell me why I would even dream such a thing? It was, it was so disgusting and just so, I don't even have words. But suddenly after I prayed that, I just had this knowing that it was because I had been specifically targeting religious spirits during my times of communion. Now, not every time of communion. Some communions I was just receiving, celebrating the goodness of the Lord, but some I was using, specifically targeting these and was trying to make it a point to do it every day against these religious spirits. Well, I could not immediately see what one had to do with the other, what incest has to do with religious spirits. So I started praying, seeking wisdom, and I wound up in 2 Samuel chapter 13. So I'm going to read the majority of this chapter to you and comment on it briefly. And then we're going to take care of business. In 2 Samuel 13, we find the story of three of David's children and one of his nephews that are all involved in this situation so this is a family matter <coughs> excuse me second samuel chapter 13 i'm going to start reading at verse 1 and it came to pass after this that absalom the son of david had a fair sister whose name was tamar and amnon the son of david loved her so what we have going on here is absalom and tamar had the same mother and the same father Amnon had the same father, but a different mother. Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. In other words, he was completely obsessed. Now, the scripture uses the word love, but basically, it's lust, because there were several different words for love uh, in the Hebrew. And, but we can see from his behavior that this was not true love. This was lust. And he was absolutely obsessed with her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, which means Jonadab is this guy's cousin. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? So this guy is missing meals, and I mean, he's going the whole nine yards, just, you know. So his, this cousin of his, this friend, realizes, Hey, there's something wrong with you. So he's asking. Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat or food, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. So not only is Jonadab a cousin, he's a blooming conniving cousin. And so he's given this advice to Amnon. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat it at her hand. Now, either David did not discern what's going on with this kid of his. And of course, he had a whole slew of kids. So that's possible. Or he simply ignored the signs 
because he had his own issues with women. Because this takes place after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had caused her husband to be killed. So we see this thing with the sexual impurity and immorality and murder just going hand in hand in this family line. David sent home to Tamar saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was laid down. She took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. She took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have all men out from me. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and she brought them into the chamber of Amnon her brother. And when she had brought them in unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. Now he was not wanting her to tell fairy tales. She answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Mm. This word folly is from the Hebrew word nebalah, and it means foolishness, that is wickedness, crime, folly. So I want you to understand before we go any farther that this act creates bands of wickedness in the spirit realm that restrict growth and freedom over individuals, over families, and over entire regions. We see from Isaiah 58 and verse 6 that the fast that God chose, He chose to loose those bands of wickedness. So we're going to be involved in this. I also want to point out that in the law of first mention, any time a word is first mentioned in Scripture, there's something significant that's carried with that word and the meaning of it throughout the Scriptures. The first mention of this word folly is in Genesis chapter 34. And believe it or not, it centers around another rape, more conniving, and it winds up in murder and robbery, and that's not good. And when she said, don't force me, that word force is from a Hebrew word that means to defile, to hurt, to ravish, to weaken. So we need to understand any time the enemy prompts somebody with one of these feelings or impulses and they follow through on those feelings or impulses, they may be sexually gratified at the moment, but what they have done is released something that is going to weaken everybody involved in that situation, especially the victim. And before the cross, there wasn't much of any way to get past that. Thanks be to God, we're on this side of the cross. And Jesus has made a way. So she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not this folly. And in verse 13, she said, Whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Where shall I cause my shame to go? Shame is from a Hebrew word that means not only shame and disgrace, but it means reproach, which is a stronger type of shame. She had no place for it to go under the old covenant. But the good news is, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 3, it says that Christ pleased not himself, but the reproaches of them that reproached us fell on him. So Jesus bore our shame. When you read Matthew 26 and you read where he was stripped, where he was mocked, where he was spit on, he was laughed at, he was rejected, he bore our shame so we could let it go. So we could legally come against it with the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through God and pull down these strongholds that the enemy has built over things that the church won't talk about 
so we could be free of the shame. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. Now while any type of incestuous behavior is abhorrent, we have people nowadays that would say, Oh, he's just bipolar. My dear friend, uh-uh, this is demonic. To be so vexed with somebody and so full of lust for them and so obsessed with them that you're making yourself sick because you can't have them, and then once you get them, you turn around and you hate them, that's demonic. And let's just call it what it is, or we're not going to be able to get rid of it. She said to him, There's no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not hearken unto her. So I want you to look at the hypocrisy. He's turning around and adding more shame and hurt to the victim after he's the guilty one that did the deed. And this is how these religious spirits work. Then he called his servant that ministered to him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. Oh my goodness, how hard-hearted. She had a garment of divers colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. So she's mourning, not only because of the deed that was done at that moment in time, but in that time and at that culture, she knows her life is wrecked because no good man is ever going to want her now. So she makes it back to her brother Absalom's house. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And here's where the gears begin to mesh in my thinking of the connection between taking authority over religious spirits and incest coming into the picture. I, 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 really? Why? This religious spirit is advising her, just stay in the house, be quiet about it, just ignore the issue. I mean, after all, it's your brother. She remained in his house, so he was seeing to her physical needs. And that's what church does. You know, a lot of assemblies, I mean, you know, we go, they'll deal with the physical stuff, the surface issues. But he could do absolutely nothing to deal with the desolation that was consuming her. And it says, so Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And that word that's translated desolate there, it means ruined, broken. What a horrible picture. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. So he's not, even, he's not even talking to the brother that did this. Neither one way or the other. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister, Tamar. So he's re advising her to just be quiet about the issue. He is not taking any visible action about the issue. But hatred is in his heart. And this is the reason we have to have a Savior. Because you don't get past things like this just because you think happy thoughts. It takes the Holy Spirit. It takes the truth of what Jesus did for us at the cross to break these kind of chains and to rebuild a life after it's been shattered after something like this. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shears in Baal Hazor 
which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shearers. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servants. So this is actually a time of celebration when you're shearing the sheep and getting ready to sell the wool. The king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but he blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him, and he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you, be courageous and very, and be valiant. So, the thing about religious spirits is that they tend to strike after you think you got away with it. And you're enjoying life and you're celebrating. Wait till he's married, drinking wine, drunk, you know, then, then kill him. So once this folly, this wickedness is set in motion... I want you to notice that the initial victim suffers, the perpetrator of the act suffers, and if you read the rest of 2 Samuel and the things that happened to Absalom, you find out that the, fam the whole family suffers in one way or another. So even though Absalom had this outward going through the motions, keeping peace in the family, hate was in his heart, and it takes Holy Spirit to remove hate. Well, he acted on his hate. He may not have actually used the knife or the stone or whatever that killed the brother, but he used the words that set it in motion. The servants of Absalom did as Amnon or did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got him upon his mule and fled. So, in other words, once this started happening, it was every man for himself, and all of the king's sons leapt. When incest and inbreeding go on for several generations and everybody keeps quiet, religious spirits set up strongholds over entire regions which are rooted in these acts of folly, of wickedness. So we find periodically that the church is praying for revival and believing God's the only way to help folks, and that's good. But if those spirits are not bound, if those acts of incest are not deliberately forgiven by the church as an act of warfare, if those bands of wickedness are never loosed and the people healed of the shame, then those religious spirits that are tied to and rooted in that incest, will cause confusion, weakness, all kinds of mental, emotional, and physical ailments. And they'll continue to get away with it until somebody with understanding rises up with the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through God and deals with the issue at its roots. Now on January 20th, 2023, my prayer team and I agreed together in receiving communion and we forgave from the very first act of incest ever committed in our region to the present. We agreed together and we spoke out and we bound religious spirits in this region. We agreed together and we loosed the bands of wickedness that have held people captive in this region. Because I don't know whether you know it or not, but the inbreeding and the incest is more prevalent in some places in the South than it is in other places. And it has caused problems. Social, economic, emotional, all kinds of problems. We agreed together and we prayed for the healing of the people that have been impacted by incest. Then we called forth Holy Spirit wind and fire to purge this region. So 
I want to encourage you to go ahead and get your communion elements ready because we're going to do this again. I'm going to walk you through it and show you how to do it because you can use this process as you begin to get revelation and understanding about what's going on. You can use this not only to come against religious spirits, but whatever else the Lord may reveal may be working in your area. I'm not responsible for your area. I'm responsible for mine. But I can show you what the Lord is teaching me and give you a place to start so that you can start tearing down things in your area so that the kingdom of God can be built up and so that people can be healed and restored and the ravages of this kind of stuff can be undone and healing take place. And it's so important that we love people enough to do this for them. So go ahead and get your communion elements and we're going to receive. Okay. If you will, just lift up your bread before the Lord. And understand, many times when I'm walking you through these, I mention the things that we discern the body is the fact that Jesus bore stripes for our healing and we receive that healing. We're primarily focusing on receiving, eating the bread of wisdom as an act of war because that Hebrew word, lachem, in Proverbs chapter 9, Verse 5, the eat, the word eat, is translated from Lachem, and it means to make war, to battle, to overcome, and prevail. We are making our war by remembering what Jesus did at the cross, and we are releasing his victory over death and hell and sin and all of the curse against these unclean spirits because they have to bow to the truth of what happened at the cross because Jesus has been raised up seated at the Father's right hand as the head of all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, and his enemies are being put under his feet. Well, the way that God is choosing to do that is every time we remember and proclaim the victory of Jesus through receiving communion. Then those angels go to work and they start ripping out and rooting up and making life miserable for these unclean spirits that have tried to exercise dominion over these territories. We refuse to allow them access any longer. Jesus is Lord, and that's what we're going to proclaim. So you lift up your bread. We're not going to deal with healing right now at this point. Food receiving the body and the blood, we're dealing with warfare and releasing the power of God to tear down these strongholds. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, and we acknowledge the truth that you so love the world, not just the sweet folks, the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are the Prince of life, the resurrection and the life, and you are the bread of life. We acknowledge and we remember that you are also the power of God and the wisdom of God. So as we eat wisdom's bread, we are choosing deliberately to place ourselves in agreement with your finished work at the cross to celebrate the truth that you conquered death and hell and the grave, sin and shame, sickness, all of it, every aspect of the curse. You conquered it all so we could walk free. And as we proclaim that truth and as we receive this bread, we're not only receiving the benefit and blessing into our own personal individual lives, but we're also releasing the power of that victory against every stronghold of evil that the enemy has erected. So we acknowledge you, Lord Jesus. You are our Savior. You have been made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. And as we receive your body in this bread, we release the power of your righteousness, your redemption, to work shalom in this region. In Jesus' name it is so. Amen. Okay, lift up your cup. Lord Jesus, we come to remember that you shed your blood for the remission of our sins and that this cup 
is the cup of the new covenant, the new living way, the everlasting covenant. And that your blood was offered up by the eternal spirit. So it will never lose that eternal quality of light and life and power. It will never lose its voice. And we thank you that demons have no defense against it. So as we acknowledge you as our Savior and your great victory, we receive this cup of blessing, this cup of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that salvation covers the realm of deliverance. And in receiving this cup, we release against every force of darkness, every unclean spirit. We release the power of this new covenant of grace and peace against them to uproot, dissolve, and destroy every stronghold that they've built, every band of wickedness that they've set in place. Because you've redeemed the souls of these people from deceit and violence. You've redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. You have redeemed their lives from destruction. And we stand in agreement with that redemption as we release it in receiving this cup. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, Heavenly Father, having received the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we now come together in agreement. And we exercise the privilege given to all saints. And that privilege is to bind the kings, these rulers of these principalities and powers, with chains of fire. We come against these religious spirits, and we bind them with chains of fire. By the blood of Jesus, we take away their armor that they trust in, and we take away their dominion. And we proclaim that Jesus is Lord over this region. And we will not allow these unclean spirits to operate here. We deny them access. We slam every door of access in Jesus' mighty name. You told us, Lord, that... Whoever sins, we remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins, we retain, they're retained. We forgive. We remit the sin because the Father has already forgiven it for your sake, Jesus. He's already laid on you the iniquity of us all, including people that have committed incest. Therefore, we choose to remit and to send away from the time that the first act of incest was committed in this region to this present day. We remit the sin and we send it away. And in so doing, we break the ties, the bands of wickedness that these unclean spirits have used to mess with the minds of people, to bind their minds so that they can't think, to keep them confused, to keep them in darkness, to keep them in fear, to keep them in shame. We loose those bands of wickedness by that act of forgiving and remitting and sending all of that away. We proclaim again the lordship of Jesus over this area and we declare the truth that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And it is written that having been reconciled by the death of his son, we shall be much more saved by his life. So we release your life unto these individuals that have been wounded and scarred by acts of incest. Father, we pray for their healing. We pour in the oil and the wine into all of those wounded places. And we decree over them healing grace. Because it's not your will that these people live the rest of their lives in shame and in reproach. So we sever those assignments of the enemy against them. And we proclaim liberty to the captives right now in Jesus' mighty name because that's your will, that's your desire. We lose the force of righteousness to work shalom in their lives that they be restored to wholeness and to soundness. That the very atmosphere be lightened up around them. That they no longer be victims of these things that were beyond their control. And Lord... I know, I know, Lord, that there have been people that have been 
victimized in this way from the time they were babies and they don't know anything different. But that's not too big for your grace to handle. So we release your grace upon them, Lord, for healing and for restoration and for deliverance. And Lord, we open every door of access that it's possible to open for Holy Spirit, wind and fire to be manifest in this region, to purge this region. We release the angels of the Lord to persecute these unclean spirits and drive them out because it is written that the fountain is opened in the house of David and the unclean spirit shall pass out of the land. And Lord, we decree that this generation shall be saved, retrieved from this folly. And the congregation said, Amen. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. The Lord who bore your reproach now restore unto you 120% of all that has been lost, damaged, or broken because he is your trespass offering. May you live to be 120 and enjoy every day of it, knowing no chain can keep you bound. Let us pray. Father, I love your ways. And I'm so thankful that your heart is so big and that you've made provision for even the deep, shameful things that keep people locked in cages because it hurts too bad to talk about. I pray for your ministers that you will stir up the compassion of God in them and the boldness of God to start addressing these issues from the pulpit, not to bring shame and condemnation upon the perpetrators and the victims, but to deal with things in the spirit realm and to loose the bands of wickedness so that it can be removed, the reproach can be removed off these regions and these people can be healed. And I praise you, Lord, that it spreads like wildfire. Praise you, Lord, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And I praise you for that abounding grace ministering to every individual that's ever been victimized in any way by a sexual assault from a relative. Thank you, Father. I receive it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, dear friend. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I will talk to you later.